In this tutorial, we are going to create this cards game using 3GS and GSAP. The idea of this game is taken from a Japanese enemy called Kaiji, the ultimate survivor, and the rules are so simple. We have two players, each having a hand of five cards, four citizens, and one emperor or a slave. A game is composed of two sets of three rounds. The player who has the emperor in the first set must play the slave in the second one, and vice versa. Having said that, each round is composed of a set of turns. During each turn, the two players must set a card face down on the table. Then, once flipped, the stronger card wins that turn. The order of strength is this. The emperor beats the citizens. So say for example, the first player sets the emperor, and the second one sets the citizen. The turn counts as one for the first player, without having to put the rest of the cards. Continuing with the order, the citizens beat the slave and the slave beats the emperor. Now with the rules of the e-card summarized, let's get into the code. A quick disclaimer is that 95% of what I'm going to use in this tutorial is already explained in detail in a separate video on my 3JS playlist. The first thing we are going to do is clone the 3JS boilerplate, so I'll copy the repositories link, go to the editor and hit Ctrl plus Shift plus P, hit enter, paste the link, then choose the location of the project. Next, I'll set the version of the current 3GS version in the package.json file and then run npm install to get the dependencies installed. We need gsap2, so I'll run npm install gsap. Now for the file structure, I'm going to create a static folder which includes our project assets. Next, I'm going to create a GS file in the GS folder and call it cards, and also create a style sheet in the CSS folder. And the final step in this setup part is running the server by typing this command npx parcel dot slash src slash index dot html. In this section, we are going to prepare the scene. So the first thing I'm going to do is activate the shadows and some color correction with the tone mapping. I'll also get rid of the orbit controls since we don't need this module in this project, then set the camera position and direction. Next, I'm going to add a couple light sources.
Now we are going to import and use the GLTF loader to add the table model to the scene. And the final step in this part is to make the table receive the shadows cast by the cards. In this section we are going to create the cards. The first thing I'm going to do is import a set of classes. Next, I'll create an instance of the box geometry in the texture loader classes to prepare the geometry in the textures for the materials. I used the box geometry instead of the plane geometry here since we can't have different textures for the face and the back of the plane. On the other hand, we can set a specific texture for each face of the box and as you see, I set a very low value as depth to make it look as thin as a card. Now to create the materials of the cards we are going to make an array of 6 materials with each one representing a face. The fifth material represents the face of the card and the last one is the back of the card. That said we are going to make 6 arrays of materials, 4 for the citizens cards and the others for the emperor and the slave. Next, I'm going to create an array that will assign the card's meshes to. Then again, we'll need another array that holds the positions in which the player cards will be in. And we'll need another one that holds the rotations of the player's cards. Now before we continue with the code, let me explain how we will set the cards in a random order. So we have a couple of arrays containing the positions and rotations of the cards. What we are going to do is generate a random number between 0 which is the index of the first element of the array and the last one. Next we'll assign that element to the position and also rotation of a card. Then remove that element from the array and do that again for the rest of the cards. Now to generate a random number we are going to use this line, you can find the reasoning behind it in the link at the description below. I'm going to create a function that takes the mesh of the card, the position and rotations arrays, the random number and a string as arguments. The last argument is used to set a name to the mesh which is important for the card selection process later on. We are going to enable the shadow casting and set the position and rotation.
Splice here will remove one element at the index random number. Next, we'll add the mesh to the cards array. That done, now all we need to do is create a mesh and then call the configure card function. And that's enough to get our first card ready. Now we'll do the same thing to create the second card, so I'll start by creating a mesh. Then I'll update the value of the variable holding the index of the last element of the array, and of course the random number. And I'll call the configure card function again. Now we have the same process done to create the rest of the cards, except that we'll have a couple different arrays for the positions and rotations of the opponent cards. That done, now I'll export the cards array, the emperor and the slave textures, since we'll need them when the hands are switched. Then we'll import them here and use a for each loop to add the cards meshes to the scene. I got an error because I forgot to set a value to the random number 2 variable and I also kept using maximum 1 instead of maximum 2 to set the value of random number 2. And now as you can see we got the cards and if you notice it they are randomly ordered. In this section we are going to add the placing and flipping cards animations. The first thing I'm going to do is create a variable that holds the reference to the selected card. And also we need a couple variables for the ray caster. Now, to get a reference to the chosen card, we are going to check if its name includes the string player card. If it is the case, then we'll assign it to the hovered card variable. Next, since we talk about animation, I'm going to import GSAP and then create a timeline with a couple default properties, which are the duration and the delay. The card placement animation is composed of three actions that occur at the same time. First, we have rotation to flip the card.
The second one is the positioning of the card on the table. The third is optional which is scale since the Y position of the cards on the table makes them a bit small. The scale happens later here because I forgot to position its sequence at the start of the timeline. Now as you see the cards are positioned at the same spot because all of them are set to be positioned with the same X value. To fix that I'm going to create a variable X that contains the position that the first card is supposed to be in, then increment it whenever a card is set and keep doing that until we reach the fifth card. And there we go. That done, now it's time to add the flipping animation. Again, we have three sequences that take place at the same time. The rotation that goes back to zero, a bouncing animation by increasing the value of Y, then placing it back at the same Y level as it was before the flip animation. In this part we are going to make the opponent place its cards randomly. So the first step I'm going to do is create an array that holds the last 5 cards in the cards array which are basically the 5 cards of the opponent hand. The next step is to apply the same technique I used earlier to create the cards. Having said that, we are going to make it in a way that every time we set a card, a number gets generated as a random index for the card to be placed. Then, once placed, the mesh at that index gets deleted from that array. And then we'll need another timeline to do the exact same sequences we did with the first one, except with a slightly different values. In this section we've got a couple of issues to fix. The first problem is that if I click on any other part of the scene, the latest card set on the table change its position. The reason behind that is that the hovered card variable is holding the reference to the latest chosen card, hence it gets animated whenever a click event occurs on any part of the scene other than the player cards. To fix that we are merely going to nullify its value after the card it was holding has its animation finished. it. 
The problem is solved, yet we still get an error message when I click on the scene, and that's because we are passing null to the GSAP timeline. To prevent that from happening, I'm just going to wrap the timelines in an if block. Now if I click on a card on the table we get the same issue and that's because the cards on the table fulfill the same condition as the ones in the player's hand which is having the name player card. To fix that we are going to differentiate between the two by concatenating a string to the cards in the player hand and that means that a card mesh won't be assigned to the hovered card variable unless it has hand in its name. And here, after assigning the chosen card to the hovered card variable, the string hand gets deleted from the name of the card, which means it doesn't belong to the hand anymore. The other issue is that we can set another card while the flipping animation of the previous ones isn't yet finished. To fix that, we are going to create a boolean that indicates if we can set another card or not. Its value is set back to true when the flipping animation of the cards is completed. In this section we are going to reset the card's position when a round is finished. The idea behind what we are going to do is simply compare the names of the cards to decide if there is a winner and who actually won. Having said that, I'm going to create a variable that holds the name of the chosen card and the other one gets assigned with the opponent card's name. Next, we are going to make a set of if conditions based on the name of the cards and call reset and update which is a function that will do certain tasks depending on the fulfilled condition. Now I'm going to create an array that holds the first five cards of the cards array which are the ones in the player's hand. Next we'll need a couple of arrays that have the initial positions of the cards in their rotations. And here in the for each loop, we are going to assign their elements values. And as you can see in the rotations, I just took the z values since the x and y values remain the same. So to sum this up, we are basically extracting the initial positions and rotations of the cards. It's like we are setting placeholders for the cards. So when a round is finished, the cards go back to these positions. Now back to the function, I'm going to create a couple of arrays which are going to hold the player and the opponent's cards. The next step, which is optional by the way, is to return the cards in a random order and that by randomizing the elements of the arrays we've just created. To do that, I'm going to create a function and again, if you want to learn more about the technique, 
I'll leave you the link to the stake overflow answer for an in detail explanation. Done with the shuffle array function, we'll call it on both arrays, then use a for loop to set the positions and rotations of the cards using values from the arrays we've created earlier. As you can see here, I can't set the emperor on the table while the x value has increased and that's because we didn't reset the name of that card to hand plus player card plus the card name which is emperor in this case. Now we have another issue and that's because of the x variable not getting updated after the end of the turn. In this part we are going to make the exchange of the emperor and slave cards after the end of the first set of rounds. So I'm going to create a variable that serves as a rounds counter. Then we'll increase that value when a round is finished. And then based on the number of rounds we are going to do some stuff like the exchange which is we are going to do now and update the score UI that we are going to implement later. Having said that, in this function we are simply going to use the textures that we imported earlier from the cards file and also change the names. In this section we are going to add the score UI. So I'm going to add a section with a couple of paragraphs and spans, then type some basic CSS stuff to position the container and colorize the backgrounds.
Now in the JavaScript file we are going to get the references to the spans to change the scores and also the paragraphs in order to change their background colors when a set of rounds is finished. In addition to that, I'm going to create a couple of variables that contain the score of each player. And then I'm going to add a couple of parameters to the reset and update function. So here we decide which player score is going to be increased based on the side variable and side text here refers to the span that displays the player score. Now I'm going to update the function calls with the arguments. In this case the opponent wins, so I'm going to pass the string opponent in the variable holding a reference to its span as arguments. That done, now in the next round function we are going to change the background colors. In this section we are going to add the text animation at the end of the game. To do that we are going to use this pen made by L. Lewis. So I'm going to copy this HTML code, then put it inside a section. And then I'll edit the height and width, set an ID and of course change the text. This one is for the victory text, so I'll copy and paste the code a couple times for the loss and draw text. And I'll also add the rematch button. Now in the CSS I'm going to center the section in the page and center its content. Next I'm going to hide the SVG elements initially. Then we set the values of the dash array and dash offset since they are the essential parts of the text animation. The next step we are going to do is use keyframes to make the stroke animation at first, then the text fill in animation right after.
and then we have the button to which we are going to apply just a simple fade in animation. So now we are going to create a set of references to the SVGs in the bottom. A game is finished when we complete 6 rounds. Hence, if round is equal to 7, one of the SVGs should appear alongside the rematch button. And here the right SVG will be displayed depending on the scores. That done, now time to make the rematch button work. So in the callback function we are simply going to reset pretty much everything. When a game is finished, as you can see, we are still able to set cards on the table. To fix that, we'll simply use a boolean that indicates if the game is finished or not. The problem is fixed, but we got another one, which is that after clicking on a card, then pushing the restart button, that card gets set automatically. The reason behind that is that when we click on a card, the condition of the raycaster is met, hence hovered card gets assigned that card we clicked on. That said, once the finished variable is set to true, that chosen card gets placed. To solve that, we are simply going to add another condition here, which lets the player choose a card only if the game is not finished. In this last section we are going to add the sounds effects. So basic stuff, we are going to create an instance of the listener in the audio loader and a couple ones of the audio class. Now 
Then we are going to add the listener to the camera and load the mp3 files. And here we are going to make it so the flipping sound is played the moment a card is chosen and play the other one right when the first set of animation sequences is complete. And there we go. Make sure to like, share and subscribe and I will see you in the next video.